Hello, virtual conference attendee to the IIPC Web Archiving Conference. Uh, thanks for listening to my talk. I'm Jefferson Bailey of the Internet Archive. I am presenting the talk, Perpetual Access to Open Scholarship Through Web Archiving, which is part of session 18, Access Promotion and Policy. I would say it's mostly an access, a little promotion, and not much policy. And for those watching beforehand, look forward to doing a live Q&A with folks on June 16th about the talk. So to get back in the conference spirit during COVID, I made a, I turned my conference lanyard into a COVID vaccination card holder, which is a thing that we have in the US, your vaccination card. So trying to uh, recreate conference feelings in a COVID environment. And plus, I have my pandemic puppy joining me partially for uh, the presentation. So I'll put her down and get underway. So thanks for attending and let me share screen and get the presentation going. Okay, Zoom looks like it worked. So thanks again. I'm Jefferson Bailey, Director of Web Archiving and Data Services at Internet Archive. I'm presenting on behalf of this project that we have at Internet Archive. So shout out to my colleagues, Brian Newbold and Martin Zeigen, who are the engineers that do all the hard work uh, behind what I'm about to present on. So let's get uh, slides. What's my outline today? I'm gonna talk a little bit about what uh, what is archiving scholarship or why do, what does that mean? Or how are we, uh, what are we meaning when we say it and how is it related to web archiving? Talk a little bit about the concepts and some of the technical details behind our project. Talk about the tools specifically, as well as the crawling and web harvesting that we're doing. And then, uh, follow up demonstrating two portals. I'll talk about them first in the presentation and then uh, maybe do a little live demo in the browser here uh, about the catalog and then the sort of front end uh, access uh, service behind it. So what was the goal of this project? Um, obviously, uh, one of our goals at Internet Archive is how we can uh, use our nonprofit open infrastructure to further public good and access to knowledge and access to information. Uh, and we're trying to do that in many different ways. Uh, but for this project, one, it was really focused on uh, what uh, are our holdings, what are our collections related to uh, scholarly outputs and open scholarship. And uh, to improve that collection and the, the persistence of those resources for users, uh, how can we do what we, Internet Archive, do uh, in a way that uh, facilitates making this uh, scholarly material more accessible into perpetuity. So we're adding the uh, open scholarship or an openly published scholarly materials on the web and taking the automation and scale of web collecting and applying it to this specific body of material. And instead of uh, ensuring the preservation and access of this content through specialized curation and ingest, we're making tools to identify it automatically in global scale or domain scale uh, web harvest and using sort of the very rich scholarly metadata ecosystem with per persistent identifiers and registries and, and other uh, aggregation services uh, to so use those as signals of things that would be important to collect uh, in the scholarly world. So what are the challenges around archiving uh, sort of born digital or web published scholarly materials? The custodial challenges in the print to digital transition are, are sort of well, well understood, but still significant. Uh, traditional curation of scholarly material doesn't scale to the ease uh, with which you can publish scholarly outputs on the web or on social media or on data sharing platforms. Uh, traditional deposit services that rely on a researcher or a faculty member to put their thing into an institutional repository. Um, they're just busy creating all this stuff, doing a lot of research. A lot of the, the workflows of that uh, are less relevant in a, in a web world where we can do uh, create things so easily. Uh, you know, preservation is not really a problem for large commercial publishers that have lots of resources to ensure the preservation of stuff. But of course, a lot of scholarly content is not in English. It's outside of the, the STEM fields. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, in other 
countries that might not have uh, the resources that Fortune 500 or North American or European uh, corporations or even nonprofits have for preservation. So there's a whole body of scholarly material that is uh, that doesn't have preservation baked into its sort of model. Um, and when you get into scholarly material that is actually created on the web, not like a PDF on a website, but instead fully web published or completely born digital, open access scholarly materials, uh, you know, these curation and preservation challenges get harder. Uh, what are the access challenges? Well, we know we have a lot of PDFs. So if you think of PDF as the most common format of scholarly material, there are, you know, a lot, almost a billion of them in the Wayback Machine. We estimate somewhere between five and at ambitiously 10% of those are actually scholarly publications. Um, so there's a lot of material that we have, but we don't know that we have it unless you know URL. Uh, web archives are not really in most search. So if there's scholarly material that's in a huge, a huge Wayback Machine like collection or domain crawl or something like that, you're not the discovery tools, you're not great for it. Uh, scholarly outputs, of course, are not just a PDF. They're all over the web in conference talks like this one, uh, proceedings that are only published online, data sets that are in online repositories, um, you know, all, all kinds of things. So uh, the proliferation of mechanisms of scholarly output beyond the traditional print article PDF or monograph um, has, has continued. So there's, there's a lot of scholarly material on the web, even outside of what we know is there. Um, QA, QA, the quality assurance, quality control mechanisms for this is not great. And, you know, we're, there has not traditionally been very targeted scholarly uh, harvest. There might be ingest streams or feeds, but like going out to the broad open web and trying to find this stuff and get it. Uh, you know, we're trying to figure out how to do that, but there's not a lot of uh, prior work to do from. So what are the, some of the concepts behind our project? Uh, sort of two uh, two different approaches. One is uh, top down, which is let's take take this rich ecosystem of scholarly metadata that's related to persistent identifiers like DOIs, ISSNs, things like that, uh, ARCs, all, all the the various uh, identifiers that are associated with scholarly content, registries uh, like Directory of Open Access Journals or Directory of Open Access Books. You know, metadata services, manifest, similar aggregation projects, and we'll call out some of these on later slides, use those as signals to find what we should archive. We're not, as, you know, we can do um, crawling, but doing intentional crawling is, of course, uh, better than doing broad crawling. So top down is there's a lot of information out there about what is scholarly and on the web and open access. So let's take those signals, add them to seed list or crawl list and go get them. Um, we, of course, obviously know of journal and publisher web pages, platform home pages like social media or, or, or slide share, things like that. Um, and a lot of these we can crawl at scale the whole platform, knowing that it is scholarly or like a journal website and knowing that we'll get all the PDFs and landing pages, things like that. So top level and top down and domain niche approaches can be applied to specific host platforms, you know, specific sets of journal web pages, things like that. And these are all pretty straightforward crawls. It doesn't mean they always work well. There's redirects, there's JavaScript, yada, yada. Um, but that's one method. So know what is out there, go get it, get signals to what is out there, go get it. The bottom up approach is, okay, as mentioned, we have hundreds of millions, if not over a billion uh, scholarly objects that we have already collected, but we don't know that they're in the archive without knowing the URL already. Um, how can we tell that all these, what, that this five to 10% of PDFs are scholarly? So we can and have developed, uh, used machine learning approaches to identify what is likely to be a scholarly article. So we can take any crawl, be, be it global, be it at a domain scale, or even be it a, a, like a .edu, a university web domain, and uh, find PDFs or find things that look like scholarly uh, uh, like HTML articles. Um, so there's top down, that's bottom up as you already have it, go back and look at it and then extract it and, and provide better access to it as a scholarly artifact. Uh, other approaches related besides those sort of strategic approaches to collecting are the access and uh, socialization and collaboration and, and 
technology development uh, approaches. So uh, this project is not just the collecting or the access, it's of course partnerships, services, open APIs, tools, machine learning code, uh, all, all of this stuff is open source. Integration with other discovery services, which we'll talk a little bit about. Access to the bulk data itself. We're obviously scraping um, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, persistent identifier endpoints like the Crossref API or the Dataset API to get signals to what is on the web as scholarly. We're not just scraping it, we're of course uh, archiving it as well. So we're archiving the metadata sources as well as uh, using those sources to tell us to go out and what to archive. Uh, and making a lot of this, uh, this sort of sec, this backend data, whatever you want to call it, the catalog data uh, available for data mining. Uh, is another thing that is uh, essential to the project. And we'll talk about that a little more later too. The challenges of the collecting, of course, uh, JavaScript, uh, bot blocking, that's certainly something that happens with uh, you know, commercial platforms or commercial publisher websites. Rate limiting, we're always polite and sensitive, but we can still be rate limited like anyone else. Um, some of the landing page designs. So as many know, to go to a scholarly article, you don't get to the scholarly article, often you get to a landing page, which then takes you to the thing, takes you to the thing, and somewhere you have to find the PDF link to get the PDF to read it, um, or it might be represented in a PDF, but also in a HTML format or in some dynamic uh, rendering. It's also uh, on the web page. So there's some historical ones that are old and weird. There's new ones that can be complex for just very large scale automated crawling. Um, and then of course, there's also URL link rot. So a lot of the metadata that we're getting might not be contemporary. It might be old records uh, from registries that have not been updated. The journal's disappeared or it's moved to a new homepage. It's changed publishers or, or you know, owner, publisher, whatever. Uh, and the URL has changed and they didn't go back and update the original metadata. So in many cases, uh, one sort of thing we found that was useful about the project is that we can go back to some uh, metadata sources and say, hey, that URL that you have on this page for this identifier actually changed and here's the correct one and they can uh, correct it. So there's, I think, been some useful, uh, we call it reciprocal metadata improvement. Uh, we can take the metadata, use it for archiving and also understand uh, when it's changed and then feed that back to the metadata uh, issuer uh, for, for correction. I mentioned the partnerships, we've had a lot of them, uh, some very close and with collaborative tech development. Some we just use our API and they're very uh, open in, to anyone to use it. And some we have uh, worked with them uh, to get you know, special access or even share our seed list or things like that. And so there's the list. We of course have also gotten funding. So uh, a special shout out to the Mellon Foundation, which has funded two rounds of this project uh, specifically to, to provide uh, you know, perpetual access to the long tail and at risk scholarly material. So thank you again to Mellon. Um, thank you to all these partners, all of them we have worked with closely and are in touch with. And uh, the Institute of Museum and Library Services is a federal funder of libraries in the United States who has also uh, contributed to this project. So thanks to all those. We've had other integrations. Uh, so on the access side, have been working with um, Keepers Registry, Lean Library, Google Scholar to figure out how we can make the material that we have archived, much of it with no other preservation option, um, more available in more places, not just on uh, the access interface that we internet archive are hosting. And uh, thanks to a couple of our national library friends who allowed us to use domain crawls to run some of our automated uh, scholarly paper identifier tools um, just on a random domain crawl uh, to see what percentage in a, a sort of large but bounded uh, domain scale crawl might uh, have scholarly content in it. Uh, we've also done a couple of partnership development things. So we're, we're also participating in the broader community uh, with this is a project with DOAJ and CLOCKS and ISSN and PKP, the Public Knowledge Project, which has the uh, open journal system, all working to figure out how we can provide preservation infrastructure uh, to smaller journals that might not have the resources on their own. So these are some of the indices that we're using, obviously DOIs, Crossref, PubMed, we're working with a lot of preprints. So the other archive.org, uh, ARXIV, the preprint server, other aggregators like Core, 
Sightseer X, uh, the Semantic Scholar Project at the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence, Microsoft Academic Graph we have used, even though it's now going away. Directory of Open Access Journals has been a great partner. Uh, so shout out to all of those. Here is sort of a, the diagram for tech folks uh, of what we're doing and some of the different pieces. Uh, we're of course harvesting a lot of uh, information in order to seed crawlers and the crawlers go out and do their thing. Uh, and then once uh, the, the crawl content comes in, you get processed a couple of different ways. Uh, one is that there are some automated metadata extraction tools, especially the uh, Grobit and Biblio Glutton, which you see here in sort of the middle. Um, uh, we're extracting the full text for all this, as well as the metadata. These are all going in, of course, the databases and into an Elasticsearch in instance. Uh, and then all the content, of course, is going into various preservation repositories, not just you know the metadata, the 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 uh, PID harvest, uh, the aggregator information and seed list that we get, as well as, of course, the content itself, which all just goes into the Wayback Machine. Uh, so I mentioned here's, here's some of the metadata sources that we are, of course, considering these archived objects, as well as the content that we're using them to go and get. So if you're looking for sort of open dumps of these uh, open API endpoints, uh, you know, we have static ones, uh, but you know, shout out again to all these partners, uh, which you can just see there on the slides, some of those examples. Um, you know, indexing, as far as indexing, we have, we at this point, not just looking backwards in the Wayback Machine, but what we've collected, it's petabytes of, of sometimes unsorted uh, web resources. And we're trying to work with, of course, PDFs, but also HTML, data sets, video, software, protocols, anything that is a scholarly output. Uh, we attempt to sort of filter those down when we don't know where it's coming from or what it is. Uh, this is sort of uh, the indexing workflow, filter it down to the like, likely publication, match it against existing catalog records. For many of these artifacts, these scholarly outputs or artifacts, whatever you want to call them, um, we have multiple versions. We have the preprint and the version of record and the corrected record, the one that exists on the faculty person's homepage, the one in the final publication, the one in the conference proceeding. Uh, we're keeping all those copies, of course. We're trying to make sure that they are all grouped together correctly um, and then associating them via various catalog records and things like that. Mentioned uh, the sort of machine learning project is a tool called PDF Trio. It's in the Internet Archive GitHub repo, uh, and it is intended to identify PDFs that are scholarly articles, basically, or outputs. Uh, and it's it wor has worked quite well using lots of um, well-known machine learning libraries and we have training sets that are part of the code base and things like that. So if you're interested, talk to me and we can talk more about uh, that tool or we could run it for you on your collections and look at the output or, or things like that, but it is uh, open sourced. Uh, here's otherwise what happens sort of after something is identified, it goes to Grobit, which I mentioned extracts full text and sort of bibliographic metadata uh, some buzzy cat, fuzzy cat is attempting to do matching of those against what we know from our DOI collecting or from other various metadata stores. Uh, and then it makes a catalog record or it adds it to an existing record as an additional file uh, or things like that. So there's basically two sort of pieces, both of which have some public uh, front end interface. Uh, fat cat, sort of big catalog, aka fat cat dot wiki is basically the catalog. Um, and we'll demo it, but there's some slides that sort of show. Uh, you can search in it, though it's not intended to be the primary discovery interface. Uh, at the end of the day, everything that is scholarly here and that is in the catalog is in the Wayback Machine. So this is all just a web archive or more of the web archive, but it's trying to do improved search, more metadata, more functionality around grouping and cataloging and association and versioning and things like that. So uh, at the end of the day, it's just the web archive, uh, but it's trying to do new dis discovery searches as well as in more intentional collecting efforts uh, as a sort of layer on top of that. Instead of just type in the URL and look at the thing, you can, uh, it's a little more exploratory. Obviously this is a preservation project like all web archiving, 
So there, we've been very mindful of making sure that preservation statistics uh, is something we're very attuned to. So we're looking at the keeper's registry at uh, other signals that might indicate whether something is in a preservation repository already, uh, making estimates of how much we have collected of a specific journal title, um, and of course, aggregating stacks about what we have. Since we're collecting metadata, we don't always necessarily find a copy on the web of a metadata record. It might be paywalled or in a dark archive or something like that. Um, so that's useful as a tracking mechanism to know uh, it's open and we think we have 98% of it, great. It's open, it's on the web, but we only have 40, then that's something that we can identify as an area uh, to, to address. So there's many more items than there are actual uh, files. Are there many more records as in the record of, a, of an article uh, or a data set or something like that as, to, as opposed to whether it's been preserved. Um, this is a brief demo, brief look at the FATCAD, which is just intended to visualize most of the preservation metadata that's behind the scenes. The DOI, which is on the little right column here, lots of uh, persistent identifier information, DOI, PubMed, PMC ID, Wikidata identifier. Is it OA per Sherpa Romeo or some other index? Is it in DOAJ? Is it in ISSN? Uh, their open access thing, what is the ISSN number, et cetera, et cetera. There's uh, what type of application is it? What is the hash? Or does we do multiple, multiple hash? Uh, so just as much content as, or much information about this article, the state of OA, uh, as we can provide. So that's sort of the catalog. Uh, what is an update in the most recent couple of months is that we did launch scholar.archive.org, which is intended to be the front end search access discovery uh, layer. And so it has faceting, it has previews, it really hides a lot of the metadata that might not be relevant to a general user just doing it, using it for research or looking things up, might not care about the ISSN or whether it's in DOAJ or something like that. So it's really intent, this is the general use uh, thing and we'll do a little demo. Okay, so demo time, I'm in 20 minutes, so I'm a little over, uh, but... Oh, there's FATCAP, but let's go and look at Scholar, and we can do the, the state of OA. Uh, these are all live, in production, well-maintained, replicated, failover, monitoring. Uh, so these aren't prototypes or anything. These are full-fledged top-line services. Uh, Scholar.archive.org is uh, growing every day, and uh, we, uh, I'll talk a little bit in the last slide about what uh, the current non-going work is, but certainly encourage people to use it. Uh, but you can see it, it, lots of filtering on the left. We got 200,000 200, hits in two seconds. So excellent performance in the Elasticsearch uh, results. Yeah, there's a user guide. There's lots of stuff that can tell you what to do. You can do this, uh, you know, cite it. You can edit the metadata if you think it's incorrect. We have some edit public wiki style metadata editing tools, provide permanent links. We're giving access not just to the, it's to the archived copy, but of course to the live copy too. Um, some things have little buttons and tags to tell you whether they're open access. This one's in DOAJ. Uh, and you know, if you click on one, it gives you a little, tells you we have the full text, it's a PDF, here it is, here's the Wayback Machine URL, little uh, thing, a little uh, thumbnail preview uh, and things like that. So we can go and if you look at it, to look at it, it's just a Wayback Machine URL. So uh, that's a quick scholar uh, .archive.org run through. Uh, please get in touch if you're interested uh, or you have user requests or anything like that. This is, I think it's useful for all IAPC members as we think about how can we do, how can we provide better access to our amazing web archive collections than full text search is great and often super useful, but it often returns a lot of results. Um, it's hard to do longitudinally for full text. Um, otherwise, a lot of our discovery mechanisms are maybe by a collection and those collections uh, are useful for people looking for a collection around a theme. Scholarly, our research is not really a theme, of course, it's a whole 
big thing. Um, so trying to find this middle ground between like the whole of the web archive, what's discovery like for that? It's really hard. Small curated archives, there's lots of ways to do it, but how can we take the successes of smaller collection, web archive collections and the discovery and the integration uh, and, and bump up discovery, uh, like level it up. Uh, so that's a quick demo. Go back to the slides. So we uh, have uh, basically about, uh, as far as papers, uh, individual research output, let's say, uh, how about 120 million at this point, uh, 30 million or so of those. We have full text uh, from the web as identified works that are open access, 20 million of them gold. Um, uh, and if you look on the web that we've uh, archived that are not in any preservation repository that we know of, not that our signals are perfect, but uh, almost 14 million. So 14 million research outputs uh, preserved is a pretty uh, great number. Uh, other work that we're doing is we're getting beyond a PDF or HTML article. We're doing a lot more data set. We're doing things like code, uh, more proceedings, things that are sort of scholarly, but gray lid or on the weird boundaries, things like protocols and software. Um, so really trying to expand what uh, what we're collecting as far as what is a scholarly output. A lot of those second level materials are associated with a published version of record article. So they're just as important. We're doing more platforms. We have a tool for save paper now, the similar to save page now in the Wayback Machine. If you know it's a paper, it can basically put it in the Wayback Machine, just like save page now, but it'll go through our whole pipeline and end up also in the IA and the scholar.archive.org uh, index. So that's super cool. Full text search uh, for everything that we know is uh, that we have full text and it's OA and we're making some of that full text available for computational research if that's of interest. Right now we're working on the citation graph. So we have one point something, I don't know, maybe we're up to 1.1 on the slide, but probably more than that by now. Uh, billion citations. So over a billion citations that we have created a whole graph for, we'll be releasing that for data mining. And then of course, sharing a lot of this uh, open uh, data that we've collected are the articles or the metadata behind it uh, in a bulk fashion for people to data mine. Uh, that's it. Thank you again, uh, 25 minutes. I went a little long, but not too bad. Thank you again to IIPC for letting us talk about this. Uh, weird to do a conference presentation virtually in your office talking to your computer, uh, but I hope the project is interesting. Uh, please do get in touch if you're interested in us using our tools on your web stuff to identify scholarly content for your own better custodial management, uh, as well as talking about some of the uh, partnerships that we can do around better collecting for the long tail and the at risk scholarly material, whether you would want to serve as a mirror repository of some of this content, or if you have ideas for how we can integrate some of the access and discovery pieces into other access layers. So thanks again, Jefferson. Shout out to Brian, who's done all the hard engineering work, and hope to see people at next year's IIPC. Bye.